At the end of the sermon this morning, we'll sing a song, Carl announced. That's designed to encourage anybody who might be here in need of responding to the gospel of Jesus Christ to do so, to come forward if need be and confess faith in Jesus as the Son of God and turn away from sin and obey him by being immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin. Others might be here that are needing prayers of strength and encouragement, forgiveness in a public way, and the song we sing is for them as well. We pray that you will consider your spiritual state this morning very closely and respond if you need. God wants everyone in this place today and everyone listening through any form, to enjoy the glories of heaven. And what we'll talk about from Scripture today will tell you why that's possible. On your seats today, or at least on one near you, should have been a page with a text of Scripture printed on it. This is the passage that I intend for us to meditate on this morning. This morning is going to be a bit different than normal. That's a good thing. A large part of this message is an illustration, you might say. Not something to be taking, taken 100% literally in every detail, but an illustration of this passage uh, that you have before you. And before I give it, I, I want us to take a couple of minutes and read this passage from Isaiah chapters 52 and 53 to read it silently to ourselves to prepare our minds for the message this morning so for a couple of minutes if you'd take that up and read then we will continue Hope and pray that the next several minutes gives you a better appreciation of what lengths God has gone to for you in Christ Jesus. And that you grow closer to him as a result. One of the least enviable professions of all is that of a coroner. A coroner sees things that 99% of us never will. He deals in the causes and the results and sometimes even the horrors of death. And he tries to tell us not only how, but why it happened. Coroners are sometimes caricatured by us as uh, stump-shouldered Igor types, locked away in a dark lab someplace doing who knows what. But I guess with the rise of televised trials and 
true crime shows, we've probably become a little bit more familiar with the work of coroners. One thing a coroner does, other than just working with a body, is to write a report, very detailed analysis of the body in question, listing and, and cataloging all the relevant factors from simple bodily measurements to details of various injuries and diseases. And with this data, he attempts to explain how and why death occurred. Recently, I read a very unique coroner's report. It still had all the expected information, details <coughs> about the body and injuries, but it went way beyond what a coroner's report is supposed to do. I want to share this report with you for the next few minutes. The body was that of a male between the age of 30 and 35, really in the prime of life. Average height, average weight. Nothing particularly outstanding about his body or features that would set him apart from his peers or attract undue attention. The body and features were like that of many others that a coroner would see on a daily basis. But that was the last routine entry on this coroner's report. Everything else was beyond the imagination. He began next to catalog the injuries he found on this man, beginning with those on his face and head. In layman's terms, the coroner reported that if the face had not been attached to a head and shoulders, he would have had a hard time saying it was human. The face had been destroyed, battered beyond recognition. And to catalog every injury that occurred would have been impossible. For there seemed to be injuries on top of injuries. There was evidence of knuckle or fist impressions from punches that there seemed to be several blunt force traumas with, from weapons, perhaps like sticks or rods. There appeared to be a ring of tears or gashes in the forehead area all around his head from some unknown instrument that had been forced down on the head from above. Needless to say, there was evidence of a lot of blood. And amidst all that gore, he found traces of human saliva in such quantity, it was hard to imagine that it belonged just to this man. Others had obviously had, had spat upon him, possibly as they were beating him. Next, the coroner began to examine the torso area of the body, and the report here doesn't get any prettier. Numerous wounds and bruises and injuries were found. More evidence of punches or kicks around his torso. But the worst injuries were on his back. The man had been beaten severely, probably with some type of whip. There were lash marks across his skin in several places, but mostly the skin had been torn, cut almost to ribbons. Obviously, the whip was composed of more than just leather straps, as the skin was torn in a jagged and irregular manner. There had been a lot of bleeding. It was clear that the man had survived this whipping, but how, the coroner was not sure. It was obvious that this man had suffered a great deal, unspeakably much, before he died. And this is where the coroner's report becomes so unique because the degree of suffering 
made him conclude that this man must have been greatly hated by someone or more likely by many to be treated like this. How could a person who by all outward appearances was just your average person be treated like this? What could he have done? Even murderers aren't tortured like this. Continuing his observations, the coroner noted several sharp force or piercing types of injuries. In fact, he found one on each hand in the same area. Once again, wounds that had occurred before death. And he also found both feet to have been pierced through. Strange injuries, almost like the man had been pinned to something. And he found one other sharp force type of wound, this time in his side, much larger wound caused by a much larger weapon, clearly. This, this wound was unique, uh, though, from the rest in that it was determined to have been inflicted after death had occurred perhaps as one final jab or torture of this poor victim. How could one man deserve such treatment? The next injury was the most puzzling of all. In fact, here the coroner likely steps outside of the realm of science and physical evidence when he describes it. How else could he describe what happened but to step outside of those realms? But it appeared, the coroner writes, that some massive unseen weight or force had surrounded and bore down on this man. The injury he observed was indescribable in human language. It was like something had closed in on the man and crushed him to some extent. Like some giant hand had engulfed him and squeezed. Once again, it was, it was like nothing he had ever seen before. And he couldn't adequately describe it, only that the force or the weight that caused it must have been extremely great. Well, the coroner's report closes with some interesting concluding observations, almost sidelights to the examination. First, despite all the trauma and all the injuries, not a single fracture, not a single bone broken was to be found. Inexplainable. Secondly, he found no defensive wounds on this man. No sign that he had ever fought against his torturers. It was almost as if he had passively taken it all, never raising a hand in protection, never raising a fist to strike back. Once again, unexplainable. He apparently just took it, took the abuse. And finally, the coroner noted the expression on the man's face. Most people who die by violence would, would have a look of shock or, or horror or even anger or hatred on their face, but this man's mouth was closed and he looked almost peaceful. He appeared to have been passive, resigned to the fact of what was happening to him. The coroner had actually seen that expression before on sheep as they were being sheared and on lambs as they were led to the slaughterhouse. Once again, it was like nothing he had ever seen before on a person. 
Well, that's the coroner's report. I basically summarized it for you and tried to make it more understandable. But of course, you read it earlier from the words of Isaiah in chapters 52 and 53. Isn't it amazing that 600 years before the events at Calvary, there was a prophet named Isaiah, whose name, by the way, means the Lord saves. This prophet was transported by prophetic inspiration to the foot of the cross where the Son of God died. And he recorded what happened. And what happened wasn't pleasant, it wasn't pretty or clean. Probably couldn't even describe it as religious. It was dirty, it was ugly, it was sickening. It's not fun to think about. I take three lessons from this terrible report that I've relayed to you this morning. Number one, sin must be extremely horrible. Because sin is what put Jesus on that cross, mine and yours. Number two, God's love must be wonderful beyond description. Because God's love is what held Jesus on that cross. And number three, the salvation of Christ must be a marvelous gift of grace because he did nothing to deserve what happened to him there and we've done nothing to deserve what he did for us there I'm reminded of a man from Ethiopia one day in the first century he was riding in a chariot and he was also reading the text that you read earlier from Isaiah, reading those same words. You can read his story in the book of Acts chapter 8. And the evangelist Philip was sent to him at some point to help him. This man was struggling to understand what he was reading. And, and Philip came alongside his chariot and he began with that very scripture that the Ethiopian was reading and he told him the good news about Jesus from that scripture. And that man very shortly met Jesus in the waters of baptism. And it says he went on his way full of joy. Well, maybe that same thing can happen here today with you. I just want to close our words, our, our time with the words of Isaiah. Some words that weren't on the sheet there that I gave you. The first verse of chapter 53. One of the greatest invitations ever uttered. He said, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The invitation is yours this morning. If you need to come, come while we stand and sing.